Honorable Island Municipality, the chair of this meeting. And as always, I would like to introduce the other elected me uh, members of Bowen Island Council, starting on my far right this time. Uh, we have Councillor Alex Jurgensen. To his left, Councillor Stu Ellen Fast. To her left, Councillor uh, Judy Getty. To my far left, Councillor Don Saunders. To his right, Councillor Tim Wake. And to his right, Councillor Allison Morse. We are also joined by a few members of our professional staff team here tonight, including our Chief Administrative Officer, uh, Liam Edwards, and our Corporate Officer, Sophie Singa, as well as other staff who uh, may be presenting agenda items here this evening. This meeting is being uh, recorded, so members of the public, um, when you speak during uh, the meeting, during the question and answer period, or during public comments, your um, presence and voice will be included in the permanent recording which is being live streamed uh, to YouTube right now, probably to 100,000 viewers, I guess, um, as well, and will be available uh, into the future. Folks who are watching online or uh, later on, um, note that our um, uh, agenda package for the evening is available at bolandislandmunicipality.ca. So uh, this council meeting is a venue for conducting the official business of the municipality. We uh, all love our community. We're all very passionate about what happens here. And I'd encourage everybody to maintain a um, polite and respectful tone uh, during this meeting and during uh, public comments, please address your comments and questions uh, to myself. That said, um, I will please look for uh, an adoption, a motion to adopt the agenda for this evening. Councilor Baby, second by Councilor uh, Wake. Any objections? Seeing none, the agenda is. Isn't there some light item? We have this. Uh, yes, there was a long table package uh, that was distributed by Dino around four o'clock, and that included uh, written submissions received in the temporary use on the other road, temporary use permit and development variance permit, which is agenda items. There were a number of letters written between when the agenda was published on Friday and the day of the yeah. Thank you. So they're included in the agenda. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. Uh, so no objections. Agenda is adopted. Moving on to uh, item two, public comments. Any public comments we have this evening? We have two this evening. Public comments. Uh, so each of the commenters may have a full time of three minutes to uh, make their comment in front of council. There will be a buzzer that goes off or an iPhone alarm that goes off 10 minutes before the end of your time. Um, so I would ask that you uh, finish your thoughts at that point just to ensure that every uh, all the speakers who are present do have time. So, what's that? 10 seconds. Oh, sorry. <laughs> 10 seconds, not 10 minutes, unless you would like to be here till uh, two. Okay, so our first uh, commenter is Jeanette Lang. Happy New Year. Uh, we would like to clarify a few points ahead of our public meeting on Wednesday, January 11th at 5 30 at Keith's Hill Chapel regarding our Bowen Cider House lounge application. First, we would like to clarify some inaccuracies from previous meetings. Um, our lounge endorsement application was submitted in, on March 17th, and after review by the municipality, the file was updated mid-June, with the final drawing stamped submitted September 19th. We were slated for a July council meeting, but were bumped off the busy agenda, so our application did not come up until September due to the summer recess. Bowen Cider House was not required to reach out to the public or neighbours regarding our lounge application. While this was the job of the municipality and all requirements were fulfilled, Bowen Cider House went above and beyond to ensure their neighbours were aware of the proposal. Additionally, we placed a letter in the undercurrent inviting questions and welcoming anyone to visit. On October 24th, a lounge application was considered and passed with the addition of a good neighbour agreement. New Council decided on November 28th to add an additional public notice period for public consultation for this good neighbor agreement with a meeting scheduled for January 11th and input requested before January 23rd. The number of letters of support for our application is over 130. For the 300 meter notification, we have 13 letters of support. These letters of support are not properly referenced in the Bowen Island staff reports. And I'll just make sure that we liaise with them to make sure they have all the information. 
The issuing of a building business license by the Bowen Island Municipality is subject to sign up for fire, RCMP, septic, and the Good Neighbor Agreement. It has been confirmed by the municipality that consideration on this application has already occurred and the meeting on Wednesday, January 11th and on January 23rd is to receive feedback from the community to finalize the Good Neighbor Agreement. We have formally invited mayor and council to visit Bowen Cider House and would be open to a site visit. We extend this invitation to the public and will make ourselves available anytime, including our operating hours. We look forward to meeting with our neighbors on Wednesday. Thank you. Thank you so much. And it's a copy of this for everybody. Next we have the Uh, Mary Letson, um, owner of Positively Fit. Uh, I would like you, that's short and sweet. I would like you to find a way to help me keep my business Positively Fit operating as it has done now for 17 years in its current location. We generated no complaints and all the while supporting the health and wellness of the Florida community. A temporary use permit seems to be my only option, and although ill-fitting, I trust that you will do your part in this process and do what it takes to help my longtime business survive. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Okay, public comments having concluded, uh, we're looking at item three, which is the consent agenda. Would anybody care to pull anything from the consent agenda? Did you have your hand up? I was wondering. Accept the consent agenda and relight your box. Oh, okay. <laughs> no worries. We're both new and rusty after the holidays. Um, anyone looking to pull anything from the consent agenda? I would like to pull item. Um, uh, 12.1. The uh, letter from Mr. McDonough. Aside from that, I will look for a uh, motion to approve the items outlined in the consent agenda. Saunders. Seconded by Councillor Wake. Uh, all in favor, raise your hand, say aye. 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 Seeing not opposed, carries unanimous. Uh, item 12.1. Just wanted to make a, a couple of comments on uh, this letter from Mr. McDonough. It was in relation to um, the Cape Robert Curtis project for um, seeking a motion to receive it. Uh, and the reason why I pulled this one is I think it embodies some of the uh, comments that I've heard of the community about the proposed part of Cape Robert Curtis. In Mr. McDonough's letter in particular has clearly and articulated spelled out some of the fears and ethics that um, uh, in conflicts feel like a bit of an undertow uh, of the community. And there were some specific points there where it speaks about potential mm, conflicts or malfeasance, uh, both our counselors and staff, but I, I feel that need to be uh, addressed a little bit. Um, so a couple of points here is that uh, in terms of the park process being a conflict for former councillors to participate in the metro uh, dealings of the park, we are a regional governance structure. And as, a, as such, um, it was appropriate for former councillors and park committee to, uh, uh, members to participate and represent us to that higher level of government. Um, and as, it's, as a result, it's expected that in relation to the proposed project, the Bowen Island appointees would participate in that body. And I think it would be a bit of a an abandonment of duty if they if they hadn't. And the issue I think so far hasn't been so much with um, participation in the project. It's really been um, how do we foster better communication and process moving forward. I think that's what this council, uh, uh, the action taken by the council so far um, has done. So this letter also makes reference to a violation of democracy and a disregard for proper municipal process. And honestly, I haven't seen evidence of any of that. I think um, the charter reasons for closing the meeting were legally valid. Um, I think it did lead to a lack of public disclosure early on, um, but it's all pieces that um, 
I think this council and our councillors around the table are really committed to sorting um, out properly and transparently uh, in the future. So in general, my sense about the Cape Rider Curtis project is that there was a lot of excitement about it. I mean, it's it wasn't about building a Walmart or a strip mall on, um, on the Cape. It's really about protecting 240 acres of um, land. And that excitement, um, you know, for whatever reason, um, didn't come out in the open as soon as it should. And I think we've taken steps to correct that. And I'm looking forward to um, what we can do um, with that project in the future by bringing the public along and having proper um, engagement processes and metro, um, my conversations with their board member and their new chair have been positive around this and everybody is um, looking to get on board with it. Our CAO and staff are currently scheduling a joint visit between um, Metro and our council that will be open to the public, where we're taking in uh, Dorman Point, Davies Orchard, and definitely in large part of Cape. Um, so this will kick off and inform everything we do this term in relationship um, to our projects in partnership with Metro, and we'll give um, you, the public, the first opportunities to equally participate um, in this process. So with this said, if there's uh, no objection, I'd uh, like to receive Mr. McDonough's letter. You're moving that? Yep. Second. Seconded. Um, all in favor, raise your hand and say aye. 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 Carries unanimously. Okay, thank you. Um, Excuse me, Mr. Mayor. Yes. Well, should there be something in writing to that effect so that yes. this is not the only piece of documentation? Um, that is a good point. Do you think there needs to be something ready, or is that sufficient enough to address it? Sorry. I don't understand. The mayor's response now was an explanation and uh, an answer to many of the comments from the meetings. Just wondering if we should admit that to writing. Yeah. Well, so that there's not just the one document on the record. I'm I'm happy to respond to that. Is that there's no objection to that? I can I can Would it typically be a motion, yeah. Uh, so, if you like, we can we can add it on to the previous motion or just for clarification. Yes. Um, we have to be video meeting, so I'm not sure a letter gets. Yes. It's not difficult. Post. It's another option. Just to have it included in the minutes. We have, we do have the video. I mean, so we could direct Mr. McDonough to the to the minutes of the of the meeting and then the recording of it. Uh, I don't know. It just just sounds easier than less formal than writing a letter. It's because the comments are on, already on the record. Yeah. Yes. Um, we don't typically uh, put information that depth in minutes, the minutes are resolution based. Uh, so that would be absolutely different than our usual process, but I'm happy to send a response to it. Just pointing him to the video. Oh. Can I ask a clarification question, Councillor Gates? Is she wanting the ants, the letter to be a public document so the rest of the public could see it? Yes, I think that this yeah, letter so a letter for a lot of minutes, and I think that it's been answered, and I think that we need to um, make that answer um, available, so more widely available than listening to a quick transcript. So my preference would be to include it in the minutes under the consent item, because then the letter's there and the answer's there, rather than somebody having to look at a future agenda. However, we do it. Sure. So, um, did you had you drafted a motion with that effect, or you... just to include it in the minutes? Include it in the minutes, or um, have the mayor um, send Mr. McDonough summation of what was stated. Uh, drafted anything? <laughs> so then, perhaps uh, yes. I was going to suggest if. If that's the route to go, then perhaps we can just capture your comments in the minutes, and then at the next meeting, the minutes will be reviewed, amended if it's necessary. 
Okay. I have a question. Um, I see closed captions on somebody's taking a transcript, so you could probably have the word for word, or I saw it earlier on there. It's yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't know if we need too much time on this. Like, I can, yeah. I can just send them an email, unless there's any objection. Seeing none. Okay, <laughs> great. Uh, moving on to item three point three, uh, we have the resignation of Wendy Alexander from the Transportation Advisory Committee. Uh, the recommendation is that Council accept the resignation of Wendy Alexander from the Transportation Advisory Committee. Okay. Uh, that is in the schedule of those my residents here. Eight. Okay. Eight. So eight, moving on to staff reports. So 8.1, application for temporary use permit and development variance permit for 1042 Miller Road, positive fit, and I believe we have a presentation from our letter. So you're just you're on mute. You can hear me now. Yes. Okay, great. I'm just gonna share um, this first. Okay, thank you for your patience. So good evening, Mayor and Council. Tonight I'm here to present on the temporary use permit and subsequent development variance permit application at 1042 Miller Road, submitted by applicant Mary Letson, an owner of Positively Fit, which is a boutique fitness studio and gym that provides and offers personal training uh, and fitness activities to the island. Uh, Natasha? Yep. Just, if you can just uh, wait a moment, we're just trying to get your presentation up on screen here. Oh, sure. Yeah. There it goes. Thanks, Sophie. Okay, we're good to go. Okay, great. Um, would you like me to start from the beginning or are you happy with the second slide? I think we're okay, yeah. Okay, great. Um, so before I review the proposed application, I'll remind everyone um, that Positively Fit is located on the Eastern mid region of the island on Miller Road. However, it is accessed from Seniors Lane. Now to provide context or background to the application, the site zoning is currently Settlement Residential 2, so SR2, which permits the relevant principal uses of a dwelling and, a, and an accessory use of home occupation use. Furthermore, to help any uh, circulating or potential circulating questions, positively fit is adjacent to several other zonings, for example, the fire hall, the RCMP offices, and um, Jersey Investment all have village civic zoning, while the health center has a village commercial zoning. That being said, the Jersey Investment property on Miller Road is also currently operating under a temporary use permit, uh, given their general services use is inconsistent with the village civic zoning. And then finally, the site has an official community plan, so an OCP designation of Village Residential, so VR, which I'll further discuss in the following slides. And the site also falls within the Village Periphery Development Permit Area, so DPA, which has minimal significance to this particular application as the Village DPA relates more to design guidelines. Um, and as this application is not requesting any changes to the building or the site, staff aren't seeking this application. 
So as mentioned, the applicant is requesting a TUP and a DVP. And like always, it's important to provide some background into the rationale and reasoning behind this application. So Positively Fit was established in 1997 and initially operated from Gavin's Gym, which is now the Orchard Recovery Center. However, it relocated to its current location at 1042 Miller Road as an accessory home-based occupation when the applicant and business owner, Mary Letson, moved in 2006. So at the time of the relocation, the property was eligible for an accessory home occupation use, given the owner of the fitness studio was residing in the primary dwelling on the property, which uh, in the land use bylaw, there's a clause that permits home occupation use um, if the resident is living on the site. But again, I will further discuss this on the following slide. Um, and in 2020 with, um, or sorry, I should say in 2020, the owners moved, but kept the studio in the current location which rendered uh, positively fit non-compliant with the home occupation use, given the owner no longer resided at the property. So at this time, positively fit is currently ineligible for a business license, given its contravention <clears throat> to the home occupation use. And then at present day, as of January 2023, positively fit is still operating with a non-compliant home occupation use. Um, and consequently seeking a TUP and DPP application. So just to provide some clarity with the home occupation use, um, as I mentioned on the previous slide, positively fit is no longer compliant with the home occupation use as the owner no longer resides on the property, which is consistent with section 3.35.1 of the land use bylaw, which states, a home occupation um, shall be operated by a resident of the dwelling on that lot. And as such, um, a three-year temporary use permit application was submitted for the use of indoor entertainment facility, which encompasses the use of a fitness club and gymnasium as defined by Bowen Island Municipality's land use bylaw definition. Now, as a result of the proposed change of use of indoor entertainment facility, a development variance permit application was submitted to vary the parking requirements that were triggered by the temporary use application. So the lot currently has two parking spots associated with the dwelling and the non-compliant home occupation use. However, under the TUP indoor entertainment facility use, the parking regulations require one parking space per 10 square meters. And given positively fit is approximately 63 square meters, a total of six parking spaces would be required to operate with the indoor entertainment facility use. So in light of this uh, proposed increase, the applicant is applying for a DVP and requesting to reduce the parking requirements uh, to two parking spaces. Um, Positively fit is, however, access from seniors land, as I mentioned, and due to the characteristics of the narrow road, properties in that area have historically been challenged in providing the required parking associated with the land uses. Um, furthermore, the municipality has not received any complaints about uh, offsite parking associated with positively fit, nor in that area. Um, and so to that end, staff are supporting the application to vary the parking spaces. Um, next, I briefly just wanted to go over the relevant OCP or official community plan policies and objectives. Um, so as I mentioned, 1042 Miller Road is currently a village residential designation. And so what this means is that in this particular area, it's designated to support residential development in the Snug Cove uh, rather than in rural areas of the island. Um, I should mention that in particular, the OCP supports the development of townhouses and higher density housing. Um, and so in light of that, the fact that the OCP mentions nothing about commercial development in this area, um, an application for the rezoning of 1042 Miller Road would technically be inconsistent with the OCP. And as a result, staff wouldn't be able to recommend uh, the rezoning application for this subject site. 
Um, that said, given Bowen Island's OCP is up for potential review in the near future, this could present an opportunity for council to engage in future discussions about modifying the OCP designations in and around the Snug Cove area. So as I reach the end of the presentation, um, I'd like to remind everyone that the applicant is requesting a three-year temporary use permit to continue operating a fitness studio, in addition to a development variance permit to reduce the required on-site spaces from six to two. Um, and as a reminder, the temporary use permit, they are, it is legislated by the province, um, and hence the length of period in addition to the stipulated parameters are dictated by the province's legislation, so the Local Government Act. Um, also important to note that the applicant has stated relocating the business is not a financially viable option, and as I mentioned on the previous slide, a commercial rezoning proposal isn't feasible uh, given the site's village residential uh, OCP designation. Um, and then although we are only in the introductory phase of the application, the municipality has received 50 letters of support from the time of writing this presentation, which was this morning at 10 a.m., so January 9th, 2023. Um, Oh, yeah. Also, uh, another important note is that given the indoor entertainment facility use is somewhat expansive in what it permits, a proposed condition of the issuance of the permit will be that the site will only permit the use of the fitness club or gymnasium. And then um, before I conclude with the recommendations, so given that I believe this is perhaps only in the second TUP or DVP, Mayor and Council have been introduced to, I'll quickly go over the timeline and objectives of the TUP and DVP. Uh, so the application was submitted in July 2022, with the initial notice being mailed out in December 2022 to the neighbors within the 100 meter proximity. So the initial mail out uh, notice is consistent with the recently changed public notice requirements to provide notice prior to the application being introduced to Council. So today, January 9th, is the council introduction um, where I will be seeking council direction to inform the neighbors of the notice period in addition to the council consideration date, uh, which if following uh, the recommendations um, are approved, will be held on uh, February 13th, 2023. So wrapping up, staff are recommending the following associated with the TUP and DVP application for Positively Fit located at 1042 Miller Road, which are, um, and I will note that on the slide in the presentation, these are condensed recommendations that have omitted the legal description and PID, uh, which are presented in the agenda's motion. So staff are recommending that uh, notice be given that TUP 2022-0165 will be considered by Council at its meeting of February 13th, 2023, and that Council authorize staff to give notice for the consideration of issuance of TUP 2022-0165 um, in accordance with Section 4.99 of the Local Government Act to properties within 100 meters of 1042 Miller Road. And that notice be given that DBP 2022-0264 will be considered by Council at its meeting of February 13th, 2023, and that Council authorize staff to give notice for the consideration of issuance of DBP 2022-0264 in accordance with Section uh, 4. Point, or sorry, 499 of uh, the Local Government Act to properties within 100 meters of 1042 Miller Road. So that concludes the presentation, and I will now take questions from Mayor and Council. Thank you. Thanks so much. Uh, Saunders, um, just two quickly short related questions. Um, and you both referencing parking, the application to reduce from six to two. Are there already two spots on the property? Yeah, there are. Okay. So one is for the dwelling, and one is for the uh, non compliant home occupation use. Okay, great. And then the related question is what's the, and this may not be something you can answer, but perhaps our audience might, what would be the, the average, or a, what would a peak time period in terms of the number of people in the studio? What's the maximum crowd we can see there at any time? In terms you know, of the, this, instead of answering from the, from the audience, Ms. Lesson, if you want to join us up here. Sure. Uh, Maximum, are you talking, are you talking the 
time or the maximum people that would the number of people that might be right there at any one time? Uh, maybe four. Okay, thank you. Perhaps just Ms. Lesson, just in case there's questions, maybe grab a seat here. Yeah. Uh, we know how important this is. Any further questions from uh, Council Councilor Jurgensen? Through the chair to talk about. Uh, What would it take to amend home occupation to be instead of where it's a uh, resident of the property to a resident and owner of the property for an owner who is operating a home-based business but does not no longer live at the home? Sure, through the chair to council. Um, I think what I'm here is to amend the land use bylaw. Like the, right. So you would just go through um, a land use bylaw amendment process. Okay. Thank you. Sounds fast. Um, thank you. I just uh, want to ask a question about that question in terms of Planet uh, Chong, when you say just change the land use bylaw, it's in the official community plan that uh, Bowen Island will have home-based businesses because that's what the community has always um, uh, the direction from the community has been that we're an island and we're different from the mainland and, and home-based businesses is more in character with a, a rural community. And, you know, I'm not, that's what the community has uh, wanted in the past, uh, up until 2011 anyway. And so that's in the official community plan. So um, would there not also have to be an OCP amendment? Yeah, through the chair to council. Thank you, Councillor Fast. Um, it would no doubt trigger an OCP amendment as well. Thank you, folks. Oh, Giddy. So my understanding is that the options at this point are uh, this TUP, which is um, fundamentally based on a fiction that it's temporary, or that I mean, this is an established business that everybody is strongly supporting, and it's. Um, that also has a deadline. So there's a, there's a limitation period to it in terms of three years with three years re renewable. So the, that means if we're using this and there's no other changes, then there's a six year limit to a TUP, right? In terms so of we'd have to come up with something else at some point. Correct? Through the, count, council to, through the okay. chair to council, so then, that would be correct, yeah. Right. So then the other options are to have an exception to a business license um, so that it's a home-based business with somebody that is not living on site. And that is possible if it's going to be like a tax exemption, but it would be um, something that would have to be probably applied to the entire island. Would that be a fair assumption? Through the chair to council, I would have to look into the business licensing regulations. Um, I'm not familiar with that, but I think one could assume you could potentially do something of this sort. But yes, if you were to go that avenue, you would have to do it for the entire island. Similarly, with the home based business and the definition of that in the um, that bylaw, um, then any changes to that would also be island wide, and that would trigger the OCP. Um, amendment as well. Is that correct? Through the chair to council, I believe so, yes. All right. And the last option would be potentially to rezone it to, um, let's say, commercial for the sake of, of this definition. And it's um, on that map, it would be the only one, a tiny lot, and with reference to one building on that entire strip on the east side of Miller Road. Is that correct? Other, unless there's a, a massive change to the OCP in terms of whatever those discussions are going to be. To the chair right. to council? Yeah, that would be correct. But again, as I mentioned, in order to rezone to a commercial zoning, staff wouldn't technically be able to support it because it's inconsistent with the OCP. So that until would, the OCP is amended. That would, have to, that would have to attach to the lot, not just the building at the back. It, it would be the site itself, yeah. Okay. All right. I'm going to go to Councillor Morris first. Thank you. Um, it seems to me at this point, the top is down the most, is the fastest 
that we could have the whole thing done and over with within about month, February 13th. Whereas uh, if you start in on any of these other processes, no issue to cut. We're looking at minimum of six months to well over a year. That's a uh, result. I was going to talk about the college of one to move into here. Um, so in favor of proceeding with the cut. And that doesn't mean some of these other options couldn't be pursued in addition to the talk later. Yeah. Uh, Councilor Jurgensen first. It definitely sounds like the TV is the quickest one to do. I think we really need to look at this more long term as well. To ensure that we're not just sitting here, our next council sitting here six years from now, going, what we're out of options and out of time. Councilor Beth? Sure. Uh, I'll start with the question for the planner. Uh, planner Chung. Is there not an option to reapply after the six years? Councilor, or through the chair to council, um, I believe it, the local government act stipulates you can only reapply after the third year, so the first term. But that's something that I would have to clarify with um, the folks at the province, whether or not um, there are potential exceptions. I think Mr. Martin has his hand up here looking to jump in, so I'll... Great. Thank, thank you, Chair. It's been fair. Um, a temporary permit can be issued because years can be renewed at uh, which point an applicant can be renewed. So they're often used in more rural parts of the province for things like, like gravel pits on the land where the local government doesn't want the land used to change permanently, but are happy to continue extending the temporary use permit, um, but essentially provides an opportunity to this review to bring the requirements that we So yes, yes, I the period of temporary use permit for this use. Thank you. Um, that's because that's what I've seen in the Islands Trust and um, uh, at some of the other islands. So it's not like six years and that's it. <clears throat> that's it necessarily, but why then? And um, I'm uh, I'm uh, also, just wanting to follow up, uh, Planner Chong, you mentioned um, the uh, the OCP is potentially up for review. I think that would be a good time to revisit some of these um, ideas that have uh, shaped the way our island um, <coughs> has developed uh, so far, giving everybody the opportunity to run part of their business or their business from their home, uh, part of self sufficiency in the way um, people have viewed uh, Bowen Island, perhaps. Um, there's changes when we run a public participation uh, process through the um, uh, an OCP update process, we might find differently, and, uh, and that might also be part of a solution. I don't know. Or um, even just for that area in the um, uh, village periphery area, perhaps. I don't know. But I just see more options, and uh, and I just want to uh, encourage us to think about not only um, this wonderful business with a person we know has contributed a lot to the island and all the good feelings that everybody's got, um, but also sometimes parcels uh, unexpectedly change hands for whatever reason, uh, retirement, whatever, and uh, eventually. We may have applications for um, a different use in that building and that kind of thing. So I'm happy to see that um, the, the draft temporary use permit um, only permits the current use of the fitness um, facility in the gym, gymnasium kind of use. And uh, uh, but you know, just if we can uh, try <laughs> to keep the idea of the uh, person and judging the person separate from the idea of the part and how it fits in the land use and uh, but um, I'm also in favor of uh, the temporary use permit. I'll shut up now. Thank you, Councillor Best. Um, Councillor Gergensen. And then Councillor Gage. I definitely think it's important to also recognize the accessibility of it. It's in the code, meaning it's walkable to many people. Otherwise, the vehicles, vehicles are right near the heart of our kind of main commercial area. It also is important to recognize that a temporary use permit, if it is be considered temporary, 
and the public's understanding of temporary, we do need to have a different solution, I think, for this. But I would be in favor of granting it for now so we can have that time to do that. But I do think the work needs to be done to uh, allow businesses like this to actually be able to continue. Thank you, Councilor Dickinson. Councilor Giddy. Um, Chair, it's a follow up, I suppose, to um, Councilor Morris's question in terms of um, you know, what, um, um, what the options are and whether or not we're, we're locked in the dates. If, um, what is, what's the existing, I guess, uh, question for the um, planner child, what's the existing situation now? Is it um, just in limbo with no business license, no permits, uh, but it's operating? All right. Through the, so, yeah, through the chair to council, it is. So it, we're allowing it to operate with a non-compliant use. So um, is there a difference in the fees? I mean, if we keep it up in the air and we don't come up with any kind of amendments or exceptions or bylaw changes, um, and it's a TUP, whether or not it goes on forever, which seems to be a bit of a fiction um, in terms of temporary, but... Um, <laughs> If that's the route that we choose to go, then how do we settle this for the business so that it doesn't have to come back every and uh, doesn't have to worry about it, doesn't have to uh, either apply for rezoning or, you know, somehow or other come up with all of the other. It's the applicant's responsibility to come up with the, the, the something that fits the bylaws that we've got. So that's, you know, trying to find the square peg or the their home for this break and trying to uh, you know figure out what's what will last. Um, it's better to leave it up in the air and, and carry on and find a solution or to um, do the temporary use program as a as a, a solution and a band-aid and just get on with it and try to figure out something better hopefully later. That's basically what we're dealing with, is it not? Through the council or through the chair to council, yeah. So, like, while I can empathize that it's not a long term solution, the temporary use permits are they're utilized for situations of the sort, right? And in a potential OCP amendment or finding a longer term solution would be the end goal for this particular um, situation. Yes, that's good. Can we? Hear, we, we can the business keep operating and we refer this to count or to staff so that we get clarity on some of these other options? Um, so that, that's a possibility. There's there's a lot of that we can we can make. Councilor Wake and then Councilor Morse. Um, following up on Councilor Getty's comments, it seems to me stepping back from this, uh, it's very clear that everyone on the island, on council, on staff, wants uh, positively fit to be able to operate. And it's very appreciative it's been operating for so long. And it seems to me we're getting caught up, uh, you know, in the, the years of, you know, what's proper uh, and what was intended uh, initially, but obviously doesn't apply in this case. So, uh, why, I mean, my thought is that we should proceed to solve the immediate problem. Uh, the temporary use permit does seem like the best solution, but I think we need to right away um, start exploring some way. Uh, and there must be some simpler way than redoing the OCP to solve this problem. Um, and I don't know if it's a, a, a variance or an exception or a grandfathering, but there must be some way. And I, I, my thought is that we would go ahead with the TUP and then ask staff to come up with um, some kind of solution. Mm -hmm. more? Well, I always used to say to my clients, unfortunately, this is what the legislation says, whether you like it or not. Um, the le unfortunately, we've got a situation because Mary and Cam chose to move, that we've now got legislation that doesn't match with the business that we all want. And the simplest and most direct and time efficient way to go ahead with the top. And then if the applicant wants to pursue rezoning, then 
they can do that. But our planning staff also have absolutely lots of things to do. So we would discuss priorities and timing. But uh, at this point, I make the motion that notice be given that council be, will be considering the issuance of temporary use permit TUP 2022-0165 for the indoor entertainment facility used for 10 to 22 Miller Road legally described as block 50 block or 90 plan 7806 of the February 13th, 2023 use. The council authorized staff to give notice for the consideration of issuance of temporary use permit TUP 2022-0165 in accordance with Section 494 of the Local Government Act, for all properties within 100 meters of the legal boundary of 1042 Millet Road, legally described as Lot 6, Block 1, District Lot 490, Plan 7806. The notice be given that Council will be considering the issuance of development variance from the DVP 2022-0264 for the variance of parking requirements for 1042 Millet Road, legally described as Lot 6, Block 1, Lot 490, Plan 7806. The council authorized staff to give notice to the consideration of issues development variance from the BBP 2022 in accordance with section 499 of the local government act to all properties within 100 meters of the legal boundary of 1042 Miller Road, legally described as lot six, block one, district lot 490, plan 70. Second. And by Councillor Saunders. Um, any discussion on the motion? Also, um, I don't know if the best way is to propose an amendment or to consider a follow-up motion, but but I think we should be doing something to initiate a more straightforward solution to this than having to revise the OCP and do this. Well, I agree that we need a long-term solution. We need the short-term one first. And could be wrong in this, but it strikes me that it's incumbent on the open to start that process um, in, in turn, not, not, the, not the TUP process, but the more permanent change like asking for is a winning change or whatever is necessary. Um, and then once that step is taken, then you'll start to spin. I'm not, I'm not sure if I'm correct in that assumption, but that's how I would interpret it. So then just as a point of information to the planner, is that is that accurate or rezoning is usually um, initiated by uh, property owners? To the chair to council, yes. Um, and just a couple of questions from the chair here. Um, to the planner, are you able to go back and slides to the, uh, the slide of the area and what's operating um, in that area now? Perfect, yes, this, this is the one. Um, so the view from driving by here, you know, in the last number of years is that this is this is this area that's kind of bordered by uh, Western Insurance to um, the Four Corners and now has the health center and the fire hall here. This seems like an area that's changed significantly in the last number of years. And um, I don't know if this is maybe, you know, an imaginative answer, but from the planning department's perspective, I mean, what is sort of, you know, where would you see the overall vision of this particular um, strip going that appears to be moving to more, uh, you know, business and government-based uses? Like, what would you do with it in a, in a blue sky world? So I'll, I'll make a couple comments and then I will call upon my uh, colleague, Daniel Martin, to, to chime in if need be. Um, but in terms of what I think the planning department sees, given the proximity to Sun Cove, it is more of a mixed use area, right? And so whether or not that can be captured in a potential OCP um, review is one thing, but um, again, given there are a number of uh, different zonings around that particular area, I would say uh, you would wanna go with mixed use. So you have the residential in addition to commercial or other um, uses. And just, oh, oh sorry, Mr. Martin, did you have your? Um, yeah, I'm just going to have a comment to say that the OCP currently extends the village commercial designation for the first three properties up in the and the remainder is the residential. Um, a few years ago, we had a reason. An OCP amendment for a property on that strip, and we, we started at 
discussion about what our house would look like, basically, house for Long Miller. Um, and then we halted it when we realized that there was not sewer capacity to handle what was envisioned. Um, but I think I think you're right, Marin, that it is a it is a conversation that I think is worth having in terms of how far up how far up Miller essentially do people see sort of the commercial area or mixed use area of some code extent. So the, the 2011 OCP essentially mirrors from the 2005 village plan, which again had those first three properties. The Snuggle Master Plan from 2008 extended the village center right, where they envisioned it up to essentially the lane boundary between that one. And with the changes on the, the other side of the Miller, so the health center and the fire hall, I think it's a conversation worth having in terms of you know, where is that, how far out does, does mixed use extend before it becomes sort of more residential. And just and then so just following up on that piggyback on Councillor Wick's um, question or comments, is there, I mean, is there a middle ground between because we've seen kind of a number of instances where it's either TUP or full blown rezoning, right? And it and it leaves, um, in this case, it leaves the business owner sort of in limbo of like what happens after three years, and it's you know three years from now, the council's going to be faced with another TUP conversation again. So is there from your seat? Process or a mechanism that sits between a TUP process and a, and a full blown rezoning, or is this just sort of what we're we're left with and, and dealing with right now? There's not a number of government acts, so it's you know zoning change. And in this case, when we were faced with okay, this this property doesn't comply with the zoning, zoning change to allow the commercial use of those to change. And then I think as planning department, we were faced with. Well, we wouldn't support necessarily this one property change designation. Even someone's south of it, it's really residential in Miller, right? It doesn't make sense to put it to this haphazard. And so that would be saying, well, we want to look at all of Miller Road. And suddenly the project of allowing it to continue and get a business license that has grown quite a lot. I think, well, that seems something that's like a community conversation about, you know, the extent of commercial and mixed use. As, as a planning department, we saw the temporary use permit as the, the option that could work. Um, in a sense, knowing that, okay, the OCP is probably coming up for review, it's just a temporary permission while that bigger conversation. Okay. Uh, Councilor Jurgensen. Um, through the chair to the planner, is that be correct in understanding that the investment plan thing spread lower there is also in the same predicament with the GDP benefit from pursuing the mechanism by which it could be the ability to market the extended of that as mixed use. Right. Sure, I guess it's on an earlier TV that was a scheme. Well, in essence, it was started at a home occupation operator moved out of the building, the business, yeah, what for business license, you know, receive a temporary use. And is there any other such businesses on that track that are the same thing? You are aware of? Uh, no, not that I'm aware of. Thank you. Okay, so we have a motion on the floor. We are uh, um, at time right now. The motion is to uh, issue notice. Is there any, I haven't heard any dissenting opinions. Is there any uh, uh, comments against the motion as it stands? Are there are any views there we haven't heard any? No. Uh, then, without objection, I would call the question to um, uh, Councilor Morris's uh, main motion. All those in favor? All those in favor, as you can say. Aye. Aye. Opposed? Councilor Getty, uh, opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Okay, moving on to item 8.2, update on the proposed island composting facility. Um, okay, Martin Plan, our, our CAO, did you wish to speak to that at all? Uh, yes, Mayor, I think um, to propose a recommendation to defer to January 23rd. We've recently uh, been in recent conversations with uh, both the grant funder as well as uh, technology providers, and we'll have a much better information package available for council at the next council meeting with a 
for the month first for a decision about whether see it. Okay. Uh, okay. Anyone would like to make that recommendation? Uh, Council Jurgen, uh, Jurgensen moves the council to serve, uh, defer the update on the proposed on island compost to the January 23rd, 2023 regular council meeting. Second, Second by Councillor Fast. Um, any uh, debate on the motion? If seeing none, I will uh, call the question. All in favor? Aye. Uh, the opposed? We can say nay. Motion carried unanimously. Uh, moving on to item 8.3, development and building fee review. Uh, Mr. Martin, manager of planning and development. Here today before you um, for a review of our development application and our building permit fees. So, we have a policy in the municipality that's the guiding principles for planning and budget. So, so these ensure that it will be on a regular basis. Analysis of the cost to provide and what's charged by other municipalities, as we'll review them annually and set at levels to recover full costs. Um, and just by way of background from the local government access is taken from the, the province of local government. So um, basically. Local governments gain revenue from, from fees and charges and from taxes, and the difference being fee structure should be based on um, a factor in a fee bylaw. You can have different fee rates for different factors, but they should not be excessive, so they're not intended to. They should be set to recover cost of service, ensure its, ensure its future sustainability, but they're not like a tax where your goal is to, you know, your goal can be to raise revenue as opposed to recover costs for a service. Um, so the Local Government Act has a provision to allow local governments to um, impose fees for applications. Um, and it specifically says it can't exceed the estimated average cost of processing, inspection, advertising, and administration of those applications. Um, and same with the community charter as a provision, which is where the authority for building permits um, relates to. And so it may impose a fee um, for all or part of a service municipality. Um, and then just an interesting note that has come up in some, some seminars on it is a recent Supreme Court decision um, talked about charges or fees having ability to alter behavior as well. So in some instances, in this case, it was about greenhouse gas polluting pricing, but that a fee can have, you know, you can be trying to alter behavior as well to some extent in your fees and charges. But in general, it's fees and charges, you're charging to recover costs, you're not, um, you're not looking to sort of generate excessive revenue from it. Um, and just the other point that comes up too often, so our policy talks about an al analysis of, of the cost of other municipalities. Um, and we also learned through legal seminars and reading is that fees, fee bylaws will be defeated if the rationale for setting a fee is based on your neighboring communities. You came and you said, well, everybody else charges $500 per development permit. We're going to charge $500 per development permit. That's not a defensible rationale for why a fee being set. So it can be used for sort of comparison purposes to see, okay, we want to be comparable, but it should be related to the costs of providing a service. Um, so the fees for development applications and building permits, and the building bylaw 489 adopted in 2019, and the fees were last amended by bylaw 536 in 2021. Um, and the development application fees bylaw was adopted in 2019 and was last amended April of 2021. Um, so I'm going to go through the, the proposed amendments now, and some of them are amendments and some new charges. So um, one that we would like to change is the building permit application fee, which currently is a flat fee of $75. And essentially how that works is you pay the application fee when you submit your application. We review it, um, and then the permit fee itself is based on construction value. It's typical you know, use of several thousand dollars. Um, and the $75 you pay as your application is, is subtracted from the total. So, we're looking to increase the application fee, which doesn't actually increase the total building permit fee itself. You, you pay more of it upfront is how it would work. Um, and this is in response to one, you know, looking at other, how other communities have done it and seeing that this is an approach they've used, but also that we had several cases um, this year where an application was made, staff reviewed it, staff had several conversations with the applicant, um, 
in one case in particular, the applicant was very insistent of the need for their development permit and staff spent a lot of time doing that, at which point, but when the permit was ready to be issued and the charge was passed on to the, or the fee was, you know, relayed to the applicant, um, they never paid for their building permit fee, they walked away from that. So we would like to set up a fee where we're recovering more of the cost of reviewing the application initially. Um, and the next one, so we have a fee for an interim occupancy permit. So this is when a house is, you know, almost complete, the building inspector has done a final inspection, the house is safe, but maybe, um, you know, sometimes it's like, well, the, the deck isn't finished because the guardrails aren't ready and they can fall off the door and they can be safe and they can get an interim occupancy or um, some of the certificates haven't been completed. Um, and so we charge $200 and what we would like to do is establish a charge that it, it actually increases. So $300 for subsequent renewals or the way to encourage people that you shouldn't be staying on your interim occupancy, you should be working towards occupancy permits. Sometimes you find people move into the house, sort of the, like, the motivation and the drive and clear off. Mm -hmm. um, the next one then is for a building permit fee. So changing essentially the building permit fee itself is based on the construction value of the house. So this hasn't been increased since our first building bylaw in 2002. Um, and in part, the rationale being, well, the construction value has gone up. So the building permit fees have gone up and they do go up based on the, the construction value going up. Um, but what we would do, what we'd look to do is to change, um, essentially you pay a higher amount for the first value of your first $100,000, you're paying $9 per thousand. And then you pay $8 per, per thousand after that. And to just change it to say 150,000. And so that was based on looking at how much was $100,000 worth in 2002? What's the first? Now it's about $150,000. Um, and so essentially, I did the math in the report. I don't have before it. I think it's about a $50 increase for a typical building. All right. The next one is for specifically for development <laughs> fees, so development applications, is that our bylaw currently says that there's no additional fee if you're, charged, if you're doing it for contiguous parcels. So you're applying for a development permit that covers three properties that are all next to each other, you'd pay the same fee as for one. Um, and the rationale being that's, you know, you're kind of doing the same site visit, the same permit, it's not that much more work. But what we've actually found is the cost to register the permit on title, which is required. Um, we use an agent who can file the land title. It costs us like $130 to file. So, register it. So if people are applying for three properties, they're contiguous, you actually lose money just based on the amount. You'd like to have a thing you say, okay, you're paying a lesser amount, it's lesser process, less review than a completely separate application, but there's still a cost involved. Um, and so the next one would be a surcharge for development applications when the work has already been undertaken. Um, so this is something that um, Councilor Fast has mentioned happens in this sort of the standard bylaw of the Islands Trust, but you know, from time to time we encounter, and you will see before you applications where people have started work and they've been either they then find out that they needed a permit or somebody we find out that they've undertaken work without a permit. Um, and so this would be saying there's a surcharge for that. So in part to regulate that behavior and in part to recognize that um, there is a, it does take more work than essentially to follow up and do it after the fact. Um, is a more involved application. The next one would be a new fee. So our fee bylaw doesn't include a fee for a referral from the liquor and cannabis regulation branch, such as the one inside our house. Um, and so we'd like to establish a fee and the $900 fee would be the same as for a development variance permits. We feel it's about, it's sort of com comparable amount of work typically and that it's a, a referral that staff review Staff introduced to council through consultation and come back for consideration. So that was a, a comparable example and a comparable fee structure. Um, so here I just have a slide of, of those changes that are proposed. Um, so three to about related to building permit fees and three related to development application. Um, and so the recommendation of the council refer this report to the finance advisory committee and council direct staff to draft amendment bylaws to enact the fee amendments. Thank you, Mr. Martin. Uh, any questions for the planner? It was I think the first thing Councilor Getty. Chair, I'm just curious about the what is it, the uh, interim occupancy. How often does that get renewed? Um, we issue them for a two-month process, and 
Do people renew? Probably half the people renew, maybe less. Um, and typically the, the building inspector will give a timeline the deadline and say, you know, you have an interim occupancy, but we want this, these things occur in that timeline. So all of the interim occupancy permit has a finite date on it and then they renew it and yeah. proposing charge for that. It's yeah, well we charge them, yeah. So we charge the $200 initially, and then we're paying yeah. when you renew that you're paying. Okay, thanks. Councilor Giddy. Um, Planner Martin, uh, through the chair. Um, your report on page four of seven, when you're talking about the uh, surcharge for development applications when work is already undertaken. So the Islands Trust has 20% surcharge in their bylaw. You're recommending 50%. And then you say that a similar provision already exists in the building by bylaw when where a stop work order has been posted, the subsequent building permit fee is 100% greater. Is that in addition to the development fee or development application fee? So the chair, so that would relate to the building permit fee. So that's if you start work and you get a stop work order, your building permit fee is doubled. In addition to this? Yes, so, the, um, yes, so I guess if it was work that like if you started work on a building that fired a development permit and you were, and then so the building inspector went out and stopped work order and then we said, well, you need a development permit for it. And under this bylaw, you would pay the 50% surcharge of the development permit fee. Um, and you would pay the double building permit fees. Um, the, the nature of it is that the stop work order is much more significant because the fees are much more significant. So a development permit is $350 or 375 350. Um, so you pay you know, $175 more. The building permit fee is typically several thousand dollars. So, uh, thank you, Mayor. And through the chair to uh, just further respond, um, not all buildings require a development. So uh, wouldn't necessarily always have both. Councilor Morris, did you have anything? No, that was and I was clarification I received. That's fast. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say the um, the 20% uh, was in a model bylaw that the um, Islands Trust proposed for each local trust area, like each main island group. And uh, I believe um, most of them kept it at the 20%. Some of them were a little lower, some of them I think were a little higher. And uh, I think um, uh, Bowen is quite different from um, some of the other islands where um, the value of construction on a waterfront uh, on Bowen can be um, much higher than on uh, another island. And uh, so let's, um, I think we've had a, in my experience, just as, uh, which is my third term, uh, we've seen a number of, or I have seen a number of uh, uh, people who uh, go ahead and start things, uh, and then they're going to seek permission later. And uh, and sometimes they're quite complicated things involving blasting and stuff that you can't put back. And um, uh, and it, I would sooner encourage them to come and actually fly, talk to the planning staff and uh, see what the rules are before um, that kind of thing happens. So I'm I'm in uh, uh, in support of um, of this recommendation. Uh, to refer it to the Finance Advisory Committee, because I also think we need to keep up with the costs. And we've heard from staff about um, uh, work becoming either more complex or we're, we now know that they cost more. And I don't think the ordinary taxpayer, um, the landowners, other landowners shouldn't be subsidizing the cost of development that individual landowners undertake. Uh, and so I think it, I like the idea of it. Um, uh, covering all the costs, recover, recover the costs. And so uh, for those two reasons, I'm in support of, um, of this recommendation. Thank you, Councilor Fest. Councilor Gideon. Chair, there's a two parts to this recommendation. One that to refer it to the advisory, uh, the finance advisory committee, and the second is to refer <laughs> council to direct staff to draft amendment bylaws. Is that putting the words before the card? Are we going to have more amendments after the finance committee looks at it? Either? Um, through the chair, so that would be my intention is, is to have both recommendations. Otherwise, it would be to refer to the finance advisory committee 
come back to council with the finance advisory committee recommendation to seek direction to draft the bylaws as opposed to going to the finance advisory committee I mean drafting the bylaws based on this report, but probably also based on the finance advisory committee feedback to come to council with bylaws for our first reading. So essentially to save one council. Um, my only question is around the fees themselves, given that the current fee was established in, in 2002, and it appears that the fees are the same, but it's just the brackets that are sort of shifting. Um, uh, and we've seen two decades of inflationary pressure since and, and, and cost changes. Is, is there a need to increase the actual fees at all, or are we just more efficient at, at processing these, or, or something that hasn't gone up in, I guess, the last two decades? Okay. Um, yes, Mr. Mayor, the I mean, the main thing for the building permit fees is just that it's based on construction value mm -hmm. and the construction value. Construction value, value. gotcha. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Pest? I'd like to move the motion. I move that Council refer this report, uh, the building development and building fee review report to the Finance Advisory Committee, and that Council direct staff to draft amendment bylaws to enact the fee amendments in the report dated. Uh, December 23rd, 2022. Moved by Councillor Fast, second by Councillor Morse. Uh, any discussion on the motion at all? Councillor Fast, you uh, made the motion. You've got the privilege to speak to it if you like. I've covered it already. I think we should recover costs, and I think we should um, um, try to encourage people to uh, speak to staff before they begin the work. Any other discussion? Seeing none, I'll call that a question. Okay. Um, all in favor, raise your hand and say aye. aye. Uh, motion carries unanimously. Um, item 8.4, uh, Mr. President, planning development, back for an encore to talk about our 2022 business license here in review. Thank you, Ms. Yeah, so this is a report I've done um, every year since our, our um, business license bylaw was adopted. Um, so council at the time had wanted to know sort of the status of the business license program was, and so I brought this report annually to give a just an overview of how it's gone. Um, so big picture, 2022 saw significantly more businesses licensed, so 676 up from 504 in 2021. Um, most significantly, we saw large increases in the non-resident business category, so we went from 112 to 161. And the both the bed and breakfast and the residential guest accommodation categories also saw large increases. So um, they both more than doubled. So bed and breakfast 19 to 50 licensed and residential guest accommodation went from 21 to 70 licensed. Thank you. Um, and so coupled with that increase, we saw um, a large increase in revenue. So um, when we started the program in 2019, the first year, um, the revenue was 23,000 and change. And 2021. So last year, two years ago, it was 45,000, and then last year it was 73,000 um, dollars. And then, primarily, I think for the this presentation, I focused it on the short-term rental side. But just one note, I guess, on the the non-resident business and the contractor um, licensing. So in 2022, we became much more um, strict. Probably is a good way to put it in terms of seeking. Um, business license information from contractors associated with building permit applications. So um, when previously we sought it from, you know, the applicants named on the um, on the application, now it, we're much more thorough, I think, in terms of wanting to know, like, the plumber information, the electrician, and the, and essentially using that building permit as a, as a point to say, you know, your sub-trades need licenses. Um, and so I think that drove at least some of that increase. Um, all right, so then short-term rental. So we and we contact a company called Hamari that monitors our short-term rental listings. So they they seek a number of um, online platforms um, and they provide us reports with properties. They are, are generally able to identify the listing or um, planning staff or other municipal staff are able to identify the listing. This, this image is taken from their dashboard of their stats that I took from right in the report. And, Almost the thing I want to say from it is so one, um, people can it, it, they can they count things differently essentially than our data. So 
They say here 173 listings. And if you look at our BNB and RGA listings are licensed, it's less than that. And in part, that's because Hamari counts it. Like if you have a if you have a three bedroom, you have three bedrooms you rent as a BNB, that could be three listings on Hamari, or even more. Because we'll see people, you know, with two bedrooms, they'll list one bedroom and they'll list two bedrooms, and then they'll list the unit that's both bedrooms together. And so Hamari says, well, that's three active listings, we say that's one license. Um, and the other thing that has a 58.4% active listings identified. Um, whereas in fact, when we go through the listings, we've identified um, almost all of them. So when I talked to our business license inspector, she said there were maybe two that we hadn't identified. So um, Hamari has been very successful for us for using the, um, we were able to identify short term rentals. Um, I also just find some of the, the stats interesting. So you can see the average nightly rate on Bowen, $206. It's quite eye opening, I think. Um, they also provide great stats and looking back. So um, this is the short term rental listings over time. And so you see, you know, as you expect through 2020, early 2021, our listings are pretty flat, at less than 100. Um, and then we see sort of mid 2021, this growth happened. So we're, we're now at 180 listing so it's you know, essentially doubled in a year and a half or so um amari also estimates short-term rental revenue on bowen starting in 2018 which is which is useful because you can see sort of the pre-covid numbers so you see 2019 is pre-covid at you know nine hundred and thirty-eight thousand dollars in revenue they estimate um obviously a big drop in 2020 2021 sort of back to that same level and then 2022 surpassed that number it's sort of 1.1, yeah, 1.1 million dollars of revenue for short-term rental. Um, and then again, just sort of continuing that same story. So short-term rental listing by year ad created, it shows and showing the largest number 2022, 17.5% of the listings um, were created in 2022. So we have seen quite significant growth in 2022 in the short-term rental market. Um, so the recommendation is just that council refer this report to the Community Economic Development Committee. Thank you, Mr. Martin. Uh, questions, Councilor Pass? Uh, thank you, Madam um, Martin. I, I was uh, interested in that COVID effect uh, in, uh, in 2020 because I didn't know that it went down quite a bit, but it looks like it's recovered. And um, my, um, my question is, uh, could we... Uh, would there be a benefit the, to the planning department if we referred uh, this report also to the housing committee, housing advisory committee? I don't know what they're working on these days, but it seems to me that these are figures that speak to capacity, housing capacity. That would, that would be appropriate, yeah. Yeah, okay, good. Well, I'll probably make a note to that effect as well. Okay, thank you. Other questions? The um, statistics that you've got on the new businesses that um, from contractors in particular, um, is how does that get tracked? If I'm trying to see whether or not a contractor has a business license on Boeing and um, somebody cuts me off from the ferry line up and gets on the boat in front of me and they press the <laughs> advertise and I see whether or not they've got a business on Boeing and we don't, or it's not listed, or I can't find it. Um, is there any way of linking that information and does it, would it have any effect? Yes, so through the chair, that's a great chance for me to actually go plug. Our website has a place that you look in the tab called business search. Um, and you can go on business search and you can search by business name or you can search by category. Um, so it's a way to find out, yeah, is, it, is this business licensed on Bowen? If it's licensed on Bowen, it'll be in business search or you know, if people ask us, can you recommend a plumber, uh, you know, environmentalist, uh, whatever the, it is, we say, well, you can go on business search, you can search, you can find out which businesses are licensed to, to work on Bowen, um, and you can get a listing of those people. And our business license inspector will update the price and stuff. So often we get questions like, can somebody who can do a hazard tree assessment, where you can actually search for, or like, to, who, can, who can do the report for development permit? And if you search DP, it'll actually show up. Like these are the people who are licensed to said that they can do that work. That's all very positive. But if there's if somebody that's not registered and there's an issue, then that's a conversation with the bylaw officer. Yes, then then you could send that photo probably to the bylaw department and say business is ongoing. 
Any other questions for the planner? I'll make the motion. Uh, I've got a question. Okay. Is the um, velocity of the increase of short term uh, rental units of concern to the planning department at all? I, yes. Yes, I think that our, um, our permission for short term rentals was done in, in 2020. And I think it is quite permissive if you look at the province. Um, and in 2022, we've seen you know quite a gross. We've seen um, you can look to examples on like Seashell and Gibson's. We did quite extensive outreach on their short-term rental market, and they ended up. The result of that was they end up with more restrictive. So they previously, when we had done the short-term rental work, um, Seashell was one of the examples of like a more permissive regime for short-term rentals. They've since they've since become more restrictive. And I do think through 2022. Um, we have seen an impact on our housing market. Um, you know, when we watch sort of the new listings go up, it, it's incredible how many times it's like a new house sale and it's a new rental listing. So yes, it is something that I would say we are concerned. Uh, in our short-term rental guidelines, remembering correctly, you can only rent it out for 120 days, not being rented all year. <laughs> so. I think there's a number of situations where it's being used for a mortgage helper and the people that are living in the house will move out into mom and dad's place and uh, in order to help pay the mortgage. Mm -hmm. And I'm also hearing there's a lot of backlash to what's going on in Seashell. I think we bounced like we were doing it. The chair, is there a way that that's like if, if the the loss of six months, is there anybody tracking it? We know. Yes, and um, Pomari does track it. Oh, okay. Um, and so there are a few in the end of 22 that we did follow up with and say, and Pomari is great too, because I'll show you like the occupancy, which sometimes can be misleading, because like if somebody has an Airbnb, but their parents are going to stay in it in October, they may book it out because they say, yeah. I don't want it available. And so it might show up in Hamari. It's like, well, it's been booked this long. Um, but it also shows like reviews from things. So there were a few at the end of 2022. We could go back and we say, look, you've had over 120 days use. And look, we've had reviews from the following days. So, yeah. Thank you. I'd like to make the motion. Right on. Um, I'd like to move this council work. Sorry. I'd like to move that council refer this report to the Housing Advisory Committee and to the Community uh, Economic Development Committee for information. Moved, seconded by Councillor Saunders. Uh, any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, I'll call the question. All in favor? Raise your hands. Uh, uh, Not opposed. Motion carries unanimous. Uh, moving on to item 8.5, our uh, scale update. Uh, I will hand it over to Mr. Edwards. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so I just wanted um, to say Happy New Year to everybody, and uh, I hope you all had a good break. And that we are, uh, we've got uh, an ambitious agenda ahead of us already, as you all have noted from a lot of the scheduling that's been happening of late. Um, and I don't have uh, anything formal on my agenda to update you with today, uh, but I do look forward to our strategic planning session on Wednesday, followed uh, up with the second session on, on that Monday, and uh, many more meetings to come. So, thank you, Mr. Edwards. Uh, moving on to item 11. New business 11.1 update to council on Metro Vancouver business. Um, so the update on that we've just come through a holiday break, but items that are coming up um, in relation to Metro Vancouver are a strategic planning weekend in Victoria at the end of February. And then as mentioned uh, earlier, when we were dealing with correspondence out of the consent agenda is um, just the efforts um, from staff to organize a meeting of Metro and um, the municipality of Metro and uh, our council that's open to the public um, here on the island so that uh, we can start getting some integrated input into Metro's various projects on the island, including Post Park at Cape Project Curtis, um, Dorman Point, Griffin Park, 
uh, as well as the Davies Orchard, uh, which I know that the community has lots of, quite, lots of questions on. So we will update both council and the community on that once we uh, set a date. Um, moving on to item 11.2, update on uh, the Council and Islands Trust business um, from our Island Trust Municipal uh, okay. Trustees. Sure, I'll start. I um, uh, just let you know, um, I had a meeting of the Trust Programs Committee today. So I'm one of six uh, trustees on that um, committee. That happens to be the um, group that is dealing with the, uh, the Islands Trust Policy Statement Update, which you might also know as Islands 2050. So that's kind of updating the um, uh, directive policies. You may have seen this or you will see this in, in some of our council reports. It's a, um, a kind of a list of directive policies that um, uh, we can't change the official community plan to be against any of these. And they're, they're uh, pretty basic things like um, um, local trust committees and island communities shall in their official community plans and regulatory bylaws address the needs and locations for marine dependent land uses and all kinds of things to do with the environment and all kinds of um, directive policies. So it's like an umbrella of policies over all of the um, islands, the different OCPs. So it's like an umbrella OCP. Anyway, this is under review. It's been under review for a while. It's been uh, lots of conversations, and uh, uh, so I'm on the committee that is an advisory committee to trust council on that. And um, I just wanted to flag uh, 12 point. I wanted to flag this. This is the the Heron, the newsletter of the Islands Trust Conservancy. So the biodiversity arm of the trust. We thought you should have had one in your uh, uh, mailbox. And um, uh, 12 point 16 in our agenda is about Link Island. That's it. Uh, uh, a family donated a whole island to the Honest Trust Conservancy as a nature reserve. And finally, uh, uh, yeah, I'm going to go to the glass sponge reef thing tomorrow, 12.4. If anybody else is going, let me know when we can talk. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I was going to highlight the Link Island, and uh, it's uh, spectacular in terms of a, a yeah, a woman has talked um, her family and her children into agreeing that it become a conservancy, the whole island. So it's just off the coast of Nanaimo, and it's uh, apparently quite spectacular with all sorts of endangered species and, and uh, species at risk. So it's a uh, huge feather in the cap of the trust conservancy to be able to acquire that. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting in the context of our discussions around the, the uh, budget, because um, there's, uh, there's been um, efforts made to try and figure out what a plan could be to approach the, the province in terms of increasing the provincial um, money to the trust because they, everything's been um, put aside to local governments and it's become uh, based on uh, property taxes. And something like this becomes um, owned by the province. So the Conservancy is holding a whole lot of really high-end real estate and trust for the province. I think that's one more consideration to try to convince the province to pony up a little bit more. So this is $2 million when the trust was founded and down to 180,000 a year, and it's been 180,000 for several years. So it's um, classic, but um, at any rate, it's, it's very interesting what's going on with the trust. They're doing really good things. So it's been a hiatus over Christmas, but. Mm -hmm. Getting back into it. Thank you, trustees. Council Wick. Uh, or Councillor Bass, um, to the chair. Uh, in the policy directive document, they had yeah. uh, I'm sure there's most of it is uh, about environmental protection and that kind of thing, but I'm just wondering if there's anything about community development. Um, yeah, the big, the big headings are um, ecosystem protection and preservation. That's what the mandate of the trust uh, is, but it's also uh, policies for stewardship of resources. So that's things like um, identify and protect agricultural land and um, uh, yeah, agriculture and uh, forests and forestry, uh, wildlife and vegetation, freshwater resources, 
make sure there's uh, the um, ensure that water use is not uh, detrimental to in-stream uses and uh, all kinds of details like that. And uh, soils and other resources, coastal areas and marine uh, shorelands. So protect public access to the shore, for example, um, is, is one of them. That's uh, 4.5.10, with lots of them. And then there's uh, aesthetic qualities. This is sustainable communities. Uh, aesthetic qualities, growth and development. There's a number of policies under that. For example, um, identify areas hazardous to development, such as areas hazardous uh, subject to flooding, those kinds of things, including shoreline flooding. Transportation and utilities, disposal of waste, cultural and natural heritage, economic opportunities, health and well-being. Yep. I'm happy to send you a link, Philip. That'd be great. Okay. Thank you. It just occurred to me when we were talking about Young's Trust. Um, traditionally, they have come and made a presentation in the councils on Young's Trust. Are they any discussions happening about that? Uh, yes, through the mayor. Um, I've talked with the CAO of the Trust, and we're trying to arrange for uh, a meeting where they would come to Bowen uh, this spring uh, for for that very reason. Um, and then also in response to Councillor Wake's question about development uh, elements of the uh, trust policy statement, there are quite a number of elements in there as, and some especially new elements that were being proposed and considered in the initial drafts around housing development. And, uh, but there was a lot of feedback in the last year about the proposed uh, amendments to the policy statement and um, trust council directed staff to do some additional review and additional work and to reconsider some of the proposals and with the new council of, of trustees um, uh, staff will be bringing forward uh, an amendment I don't know what that looks like and and a proposed timeline as, as well I don't know what that looks like I, I think it's too soon to say. It's what too soon. We discussed it today, but all we did today really was uh, through the chair, excuse me, uh, was elect a uh, chair of our committee and a vice chair and decide who would sit on financial planning committee and get a bit of orientation and an overview. So it's still very early days. I, I would say also that uh, uh, Bowen Island Municipal Council in the previous term did uh, submit um, some comments into the process uh, already. So um, staff can help with those. And it's all, the input is on the website. That's right. Um, through the chair, I guess my, what I'm really wondering about there is whether um, community development, uh, housing um, supports for the community um, are being encouraged or are being limited by these policy statements, then which direction is it going? I can speak to that. Uh, the, the project of updating the um, uh, trust policy statement uh, had a number of uh, uh, main goals, main objectives or key areas. One of them was housing. One of them was First Nations reconciliation. The Island's Trust area has 30 plus nations uh, whose homelands are in the area. And um, uh, the third one was climate change. So these are all things that badly need an update after 20 years or whatever it's been. And um, uh, the world has changed and is changing. And uh, um, so the, the focus was on those. I think it's broadened out a little bit since then, but uh, yeah, certainly housing is in there and the idea of sustainable communities. Is there, I mean, just to following up on that housing question, is there, um, given that Bowen is the only municipality within the trust, and we have our own planning department, we generally um, uh, are dealing with our own housing issues. What Do you see any linkages or, or, or what do you see as a strategic linkages between what the Island Trust is doing with housing and what Bowen Island is doing with housing and what the role either as steward, servant, or leader should be um, in that? Well, we're a member of the Federation, uh, not leader or steward or servant. Yeah. And uh, so 
uh, Judy and I are the formal, um, we sit on trust council, mm -hmm. um, and uh, but there's lots of um, opportunities for input. I think, uh, like I said, any amendment we make to our official community plan uh, needs to be considered alongside the directive um, policy statement directives. And uh, but um, apart from that, uh, I don't see that there's a lot of um, difference. I'm sorry, I didn't come prepared to speak. Oh, yeah. and, and there'll be lots of there are great questions, and uh, everybody's got these questions. And uh, we're back to Leeds. I'm going to go to Congregetti first, and then uh, to uh, Edwards. Through the chair, at the beginning of every council meeting, the, the two that I've been to so far, um, there's a round table where people. Um, give an update to the rest of the trustees in terms of what's happening on their island. And I would say that probably 80 to 90% of the problems that were discussed in terms of serious issues, uh, particularly on Denman and Salt Spring, they were talking in Denman, apparently somebody had um, avoided going for health, medical services and had ended up died in their tent. Um, and they were, the community was very upset about it. Uh, and I may have all the facts wrong, but there was something that was very upsetting. But housing, I think, is a massive, uh, significant issue on the other um, islands. And I'm not familiar with all the committees and you know who actually is going to be dealing with it. But um, I think that there's, there is a great deal that everybody's trying to figure out in terms of jurisdictions and federal funding and you know, whether it's rural or urban. And, and he's got a bigger problem. So um, that was, I had sent you something that was from the, um, yeah. we get legislative um, highlights and we get um, copies of all the test things that have to do with trust. So um, I'm feeding you as much housing stuff as I can uh, okay. get from that. But, um, well, and the, the latest one was CRD report, Capital Regional District. So it's not specifically violence. Uh, trust, but I think it's very much a, a live issue with uh, housing in particular, economics, and, and you know, how to keep people on the line, and services, and everything. So, thank you. Service? Well, thank you, Mayor. I was going to suggest that um, once we get clarity on what the new uh, amendments to the proposed changes are and what the timeline is, I would recommend that we have a dedicated session. Uh, perhaps a committee of the whole, just on on that alone, and staff will do a comprehensive review and provide a comprehensive feedback, and we can easily uh, um, add in our comments and from our previous response as well. Uh, you know, there's likely to be a lot of similarities there. Uh, and in regards to the housing elements, they were really looking to try to. Um, provide clarity around what, how trust as an entity would like to see housing and density in particular be considered. Um, and I, I wouldn't go to say that it was more restrictive or more lenient, but that they were trying to enter into that space where they, they were. Thank you. Thank you. Um, item 11.3 update uh, to Council on Transit Affairs Council. There haven't been any meetings. The next meeting of Transit Affairs Council is on January 26th, where we'll uh, receive committee appointments from Chair <laughs> Brad West. Uh, so I anticipate a significant update in our first meeting. And that brings us to question period. Uh, so, question period is an opportunity for members of the public uh, or elect if you'd like to ask questions. Uh, or uh, clarification uh, to an item discussed at the meeting. So questions must relate to an item on the agenda and questions must be directed to the mayor. Um, so questions are limited to two questions per speaker and must not exceed three minutes total. Uh, is there anyone from the public who would like to ask a question? You're good, you sure? Uh, is, there any, is there anyone online who would ask a question? Nope. nope. I did not a question, comment. Yes, <laughs> Has anybody read the North Shore News article about the Free Violet? Yes. Yes. No, I'd like it. So Free Violets is a little island off um, the other side there. And uh, the uh, as 
Lando family has just given it to the district of West End. One of the little bear bird nesting type islands with the uh, off seal rock or whatever we used to call it. Yeah, that's right. Well, it's off of West Bend. Yeah, uh, that's nice little addition. Well, that's an addition to their gift many, many years ago for playing this. All right, on. We've been all sort of using this Flemish too. Okay, and then item uh, 14 adjournment. All in favor, raise your hand, say that. All right, motion carries the R. Well, then I 